emergency meeting to order, please. And uh, glad to be back. I know we took a month off, but we're back, back in business. So uh, we'll do uh, introductions. I'm seeing who's taking a bite, and I'll go to them first. <laughs> so uh, I'll start. Sid Lykin, Lane County Board of Commissioners, current chair of MPC. I'll go to my left. Uh, Pat Farr, Board of County Commissioners. First time you've done your left. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that. Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, boy. Need the drum. <laughs> yeah. What, Dan? Okay. Dan Hurley, Interim Public Works Director, Lane County. Uh, Christine Lundberg, Mayor of Springfield. Gino Grimaldi, City of Springfield. Patty Giannone, City of Coburg. Ann Heath, City of Coburg. Paul Thompson, LCOG. Brandy Brindle, ODOT. HALTD. Stephen Yett, LTD. Kate Reed, LTD. Lynn Taylor, Minutes Recorded. Sarah Madari, City of Eugene. Alan Zelenka, City of Eugene, and I need to leave about halfway through. Lucy Venice, City of Eugene. Okay, and we'll go to the audience. Tom, you want to start? So, Calipulia High School student, uh, and what, what was your name again? Well, welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here. That's great. So, uh, next item then is the uh, approval of the February 1st, 2018 meeting minutes, and hopefully you've had a chance to look. And do I have a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Uh, moved by Mayor Lumberg, seconded by Bar Mayor Venice. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, carries unanimously. Next item is adjustments to the agenda. And if MPC members have any announcements they'd like to make, we can cover those now if you wish. I know we don't have any adjustments. I'm aware of Paul and I met beforehand. I don't think there's any adjustments, so good. Uh, comments from the audience. I don't know if we have anybody signed up. Okay. Anybody willing, wanting to speak? All right, mm -hmm. seeing none. Uh, move on to item six. This is the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization issues. First item is a draft FY19 Unified Planning Work Program addendum and, uh, and, and funding. So, Paul? Yes, I'd like to do a quick uh, presentation on what's in your packet and what we are bringing forward to you. Ask you to conduct a public hearing on this. Um, and then provide some feedback. So as you know, we have uh, a federal, re federal requirement for the MPO to have a unified planning work program that not only is supposed to indicate all of the work that the MPO will do using the federal funds, but also supposed to indicate and coordinate the transportation planning work throughout the region by all of the jurisdictions. Uh, we have a two-year unified planning work program and you approved a new two-year UPWP uh, last year. So what we do in the midpoint of each UPWP is do a midpoint addendum. Part of the reason for that is things change in the middle of the two-year period. And the other main reason for it is when you adopt the two-year one, you can only have one year of funding approved at a time. Um, the feds only give us that, that and the ODOT uh, staff and funding only as it comes up one year at a time. So in your packet is the addendum to the adopted two-year UPWP. Um, I will be honest that in this UPWP addendum, there's not a lot of changes. We have really adjusted timeframes, uh, tried to move some things around where either new work has come up since you adopted the, the standing uh, work program a year ago or um, 
things have fallen off. A large part of what you see in here is special projects in the, in the um, last five or six pages, and that's where some of the things that the local agencies are doing have been <coughs> updated, and, and so there's new information there. You can cruise through to see what's happening throughout the region, both in um, planning and in some cases implementation. Um, and then the final page is, like I said, next fiscal year's funding because we can only do that one year at a time. This funding is essentially unchanged from this current year's funding. There was a slight modification to the amount of federal funds that the MPO itself will receive. Um, frankly, those were very small amounts. I think the difference in one case was under $2,000. Um, so essentially the MPO funding is being held level and then the funding that the MPO provides to each of the jurisdictions with the ex exception of ODOT to conduct their planning uh, remains the same as it currently is. So we're not asking for any change in those funding levels at this time. Um, I'm, I'm open to answering questions, but this is pretty straightforward. Again, we have to have a public hearing, a 30-day public comment period, which will be open until um, early May. And then in May, we would ask for your approval of this so that we can enter into the contracts for all of this funding with ODOT by July 1st. Okay, so before I open the public hearing, is there any questions from members? Okay, seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. So anybody wishing to speak to the subject, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. I'm seeing nobody. Okay, and uh, this is one where we're not, you're not asking us to take action today, but just conduct a public hearing, correct? Yes, and again, give us any feedback, ask questions, have discussion among yourselves if there's anything that you um, need clarification on. Okay, very good, all right. Thank you, Paul. Next item then is the draft amendment to the Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program. And this uh, is a specifically a city of Coburg request to reprogram STBGU funds. And uh, Paul? Uh, this will actually be Dan. If oh, Dan. Yeah, sorry about that, Dan. No problem, thank you. <clears throat> so the, uh, the proposed amendment to the MTIP is to, as Commissioner Lyke has said, uh, move MPO discretionary funds from one Coburg Loop Path project, phase four, into another Coburg Loop Path project, North Coburg Industrial Way project. Uh, that would be a new project that's not currently programmed. The reason is that the cost for the phase four pro project is prohibitively high, and uh, this is a way to use those funds productively in a consistent way. Um, what we're it would move the full amount, so a total of $627,999, the STBGU, from the one project into the other. Preliminary engineering and construction, the new phases would be uh, 2019 engineering with 2020 construction. Again, we're looking for uh, public hearing. It's currently out uh, for a public comment period, 30 days, and then action next month. Okay. So questions, comments? Okay, this time then we'll open the public hearing and so anybody wishing to speak to this subject, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. And seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. And again, this is just, uh, this is open for comment period. And how long is the, uh, the is the written record still open or? Written record, uh, email comments, opportunities for uh, comments to be provided to the Transportation Planning Committee at its meeting um, uh, through April 28th. Yep. And again, um, per the public participation plan, all of these are a minimum 30-day public comment period with the public hearing. All right, very good, thank you. Questions? Yes, Councilor? It actually relates to what's not on the page of the map. So. Can you ride your bike from the new connect, the new uh, part, the uh, just open part of the uh, bike path, ped, pedestrian path uh, that goes through the new construction at the interchange uh, I-5 and Beltline? Can you, is this a long-term plan to connect all the way up to Coburg? Can Coburg respond to that? We're not gonna pay for that, I don't think, but. <laughs> <laughs> not darn. <laughs> It's kind of distance, actually. It would be lovely. We would love to be able to get to Coburg without going on busy Coburg Road, for sure. Um, I don't so this connects all the way, future connects to Armitage <coughs> Park. Right. 
it's not that far from there. Yeah, that's true. I think one of the challenges is is that is the cost would be pretty high due to the crossings of the Muddy Creek area and waterways, uh, bridges would have to be built. Um, and so I think that would be one of the drawbacks yeah. of pursuing that in the near future. <coughs> Yeah, so you'd have to ride your bike on Coburg Road for right. a good chunk of it. Yeah. Anything to add, Paul? No, I was just going to uh, essentially echo yeah. some of what's been said. The the you know the jurisdiction obviously on the south side of the McKenzie is is not under you know Coburg's control. There are um, perhaps alternate routes if you get to the north end of the newly opened path near the Register Guard uh, Veterans Administration area, you wouldn't necessarily have to come out to Coburg Road. You could actually cross over um, and use the old Armitage Road that goes through the farmland between um, Old Game Farm and I-5. There is a route that gets you to Armitage, and if you could just yeah, right to climb the... that little incline up to the old railroad bridge. Um, so again, there's just concepts out there, but there's been nothing beyond discussions of concepts. Be a great bike ride. Yeah, we can. Would be. All right. Any other questions? All right. Very good. So then we'll move to item C, and that's a draft amendment to the Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program. And this is City of Eugene request to reprogram STBGU funds. Dan? Yeah. This is similar to the last one in that uh, the city is requesting to move STBGU funds from one program, one project to another project. And in this case, it's from an existing project to another existing project. Um, the uh, request is to move $400,000 from the engineering phase of Eugene Seismic Bridges project to the engineering phase of City of Eugene's Coburg Road Ferry Street Bid Bridge project. Uh, just to catch you up on, on what those two projects are and why they're requesting this change. There was a phase one seismic analysis done uh, in the city of Eugene of 56 bridges, uh, which prioritized or identified 13 bridges for further analysis. The seismic bridges project uh, represents the phase two seismic study of those 13 bridges, which included the Ferry Street Bridge. Concurrently, there was an examination of lifeline routes uh, Lifeline route continuity following a Cascadia magnitude event, which identified the Ferry Street Bridge as the most important bridge in the city inventory. So that led to the creation of the Ferry Street Bridge project for minor repairs to that bridge. What is being requested is to move $400,000 from the seismic bridges into the Ferry Street Bridge project to essentially just combine the efforts for this bridge into a single project. Very good. Questions? Yeah. Okay, then we'll open the public hearing. Any, anybody wishing to speak to this subject? Please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Seeing no one, we'll cl close the public hearing. <coughs> and again, the record is open till, the written record is open till 28th. Yep. All right. Uh, moving on then, uh, item D is a point to point Safe Routes of School program, FFY19 funding. Yeah. And Paul, looks like you're you're up on this one. You know, I do have my name on the agenda, but I asked Dan if he would tell. All right, so, so. Dan, you're up on this Thank one. You. So, <laughs> this is a programming of new discretionary MPO discretionary funds um, for the Point to Points Regional Safe Routes to School program for FFY19. This would just maintain the current level of Safe Routes to School K-8 programming in the 4J Bethel and Springfield School Districts through federal fiscal year 19. Uh, MPC has previously uh, supported this project in several prior years. This is just maintaining it another year forward. The request is for $143,288. Any further questions about it? Questions? Mayor Lumberg? Um, I'm, I might, I'll ask you, Dan, or I'll look to Emma to help clarify that what we're doing is just paying for the coordinator, <clears throat> is that we're paying for the positions right now to keep continuity with the program? I believe that's correct. Yes. And so... We're, we're continuing the 
programmatic funding at the three school districts. This is separate from the new statewide infrastructure funding that will be available later. This is continuing your commitment for the programs at the three school <coughs> districts that have been very successful. And later on your agenda today, you'll hear the annual report on the programs. So part of that is I'm, my understanding is Springfield contributes half to, and I'm still looking at half, um, the school district contributes half to that position. So that's different than the other school districts. Is that correct too? Yes, that's, that's essentially uh, been the case now uh, since we started funding this, this way. Uh, Springfield School District has provided a substantial match to these federal funds. Again, you have to be able to match the federal funds. Um, staff discussed when this request came forward, um, possibly bringing to you a request for three years worth of funding. And to be honest, because the funding for Safe Routes to Schools is changing not only with the infrastructure funding uh, through the state, but perhaps some changes to the state support for the programmatic funding, we decided to scale back today's request to just one year so that we can look and see how other things change before we talk about future years and perhaps adjusting how the programs are funded in Springfield and where Springfield School District uses its money, it might be more effective for them to use what they're currently contributing towards match for this to use it for match for the uh, statewide infrastructure funding. Those discussions will come forward perhaps around a year from now. So again, we decided just to go with one more year of programmatic funding as is and perhaps um, more significant changes to it next year. Okay. Well, that's what I just wanted to clarify <clears throat> was that what we're approving is something that will be for the, a year and then we're going to revisit the entire subject and figure out what you know makes the most sense for us regionally and for each one of the uh, recipients so that we get the biggest bang for our buck. Okay. Very good. Now, is this the first use of the CMAC money? This is not CMAC. I thought it had CMAC money in it that's being matched. No? It wouldn't be because of that money. It's not, um, if you're looking at the application, the application mentions CMAC only because it's a, it's a uniform application we use for all the different types of funding, uh, but this one is not specifically using CMAC. Right. They identify under other funds committed for this project, uh, CMAC, but that's referencing other projects that just support safe Oh, yeah, I know. It's not this particular project, but it goes right. to point to point. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, at this time then we'll open the public hearing uh, on this item. If anybody's interested in testifying, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and the written record remains open till same date, April 28th. All right, very good. All right, so moving on to item E and strategic assessment and uh, now I think it's Paul, so. No, actually I delegated again. <laughs> <laughs> I got, since I'm standing in for Brenda. That's true. That's I'm standing in for Brenda today, I had staff stand. <laughs> Ellie's gonna lead off on this, I'll add a few things. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Kelly Clark and with the MPO. So one of the projects that we'll be over undertaking over the next year is an update to the Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP. Um, so as a technical exercise and a precursor to that effort, We've been kind of exploring an option of using a strategic assessment um, process or exercise. And with that, we would um, coordinate with the Department of Land Conservation and Development, or DLCD and ODOT, and um, use their scenario planning um, tools, which would allow us to test some outcomes related to um, various scenarios around autonomous vehicles, mode share, uh, uh, transportation option policies, and investments in the system. And um, some of the outcomes I think that are highlighted in your uh, memo that we could see are daily vehicle miles traveled, how that would kind of shift if we explore different policy options or bundles, mode share, mode shift, uh, annual auto delay, um, percent of population in mixed use areas, annual bike walk trips, again that mode share kind of uh, look, emissions, travel costs, and whatever else is in the model now that hasn't been there before. Um, this is a voluntary exercise that we would be um, exploring and in, in <coughs> into with NPC support. 
uh, supported at both the state and federal levels as kind of that more database technical exercise to, ex to guide policy development at the RTP level. And the TPC has already supported this effort and now we're here for your feedback and asking for your support. So a little bit of history on this. Uh, as most of you are aware, several years ago, it was mandated that uh, Portland Metro carry out a scenario planning process that resulted in uh, adopting a scenario. And we were required to carry out a scenario planning process that at least identified a preferred scenario but didn't take any action on adoption or implementation of that. And out of those efforts came um, what DLCD termed strategic assessments. So they took those scenario planning exercises and turned them into tools that they offered uh, support to other jurisdictions around the state to do strategic, strategic assessments around future scenarios. Um, Corvallis has engaged in the strategic assessment process and so have other areas. And what they're offering us now is the ability to use new statewide tools that they can um, apply here to train our staff to be able to run that model so that we can continue to use it. And as Kelly said, we can test um, future strategies that will be part of developing a new RTP that we need to do over the next four years or so, a new long range plan for the MPO, and see what those different strategies result in in terms of mode shift, um, you know, things like bike ped use, um, delay, congestion, emissions, various things that could come out of the tool. We want to make sure that you understood that this is a voluntary effort. It would involve some of your staff time. It would become part of the work program for a year or two. Um, but you know, ODOT and DLCD are offering their expertise at no cost to us. And it would result in information that you know, we'd bring to you as part of the overall development of new policies and new long range plan. And you could you know, consider that information as you please. Questions? Ellen? So, Paul, this, is, this basically uses the tool that was developed for the scenario planning that, that ODOT built and, and uh, Metro played a big role? It, it, it plays off of um, the <clears throat> efforts that, that ODOT, DLCD, Metro, and indeed we did yeah, we back through that, that whole process. You know, we were also instrumental in helping develop some of the tools. So yes, it does, it is an evolution of those tools, if you will. Yeah, that was my question. So that tool, that was a couple of years ago. So yes. it's, it's evolved and now, and so this really basically asked them to train our staff to be able to use and to help use it and to and to actually do them help do the modeling because I remember it there's 95 people at Metro doing this and we have one that's exactly right and I'll add that it does have um, some updates that allow us to test autonomous vehicles which is kind of one of the things that started our interest in pursuing this and better look at bike and pedestrian um, mode shift and in, in use and they're and they're doing that um, they're on their nickel so yeah, they are at least uh, to help us do this. The, the technical planning, the, the technical piece, and certainly uh, we would be contributing, if you will, our nickel in terms of getting trained on the technical piece, and then it would be up to us to carry forward the information into any sort of policy or strategy implementation in the long-range plan. Um, and you know, Kelly raised one of the new things that wasn't in the tool or the model several years ago, which is the autonomous vehicle component. That's very timely. I'll be talking about that a little bit more under the legislative update, actually. Uh, there's several things that are developing uh, statewide and locally and at the university around autonomous vehicles, so this is very timely. Good, yeah. Uh, who will be doing it? Kelly? Staff. Uh, okay. <laughs> to be determined. Ella. It, it may be, uh, yeah, we, 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 ha um, we need to figure that out. <clears throat> Okay, my number. Um, so can you clarify, it, since it's voluntary, is that by jurisdiction that we participate? I, I know when we did our scenario planning, it was very different than um, either Cobra or Eugene, and that was part of what got us to the table and kept us there, is that we could <clears throat> utilize uh, the tool as we saw fit and put in what we wanted to put in. So I have a concern that um, we're working on a lot of plans. We're, we're going to talk about point to point a little bit later and I'll bring up <coughs> Gateway MX one more time is there's, there's things that we're working on and so I'm not as 
I'm a, a little more concerned, <clears throat> that, you know, a scenario planning tool where we're going with it, what's the state goal with it, et cetera, that it was a little bit difficult for Springfield to wrap our heads around one more planning effort when we're already in a lot of planning efforts. So what are we going to gain and where is the long-term goal? And the, the, it'll not be real popular if we get to the point where we suddenly have to, that this becomes mandatory rather than voluntary. And it looks, it's moving, it looks like we're moving that way. If I can respond, um, first I would, characterize this as not adding another planning effort. We are required as the MPO to carry out the planning effort to update the long range plan, the RTP. <clears throat> that is the planning effort that we're, we'll be engaged in. That's not as a result of this, that's as you are well aware, something we have to do irregardless of this. This is a tool that will provide information to that planning effort. This will not create a new planning effort. Um, the other thing is that through several statewide committees and discussions, um, there have been a number of people who have raised the question of moving towards mandatory by DLCD or other state agencies, and they have repeatedly assured us that there is no such intention. There is no mandatory movement um, uh, or movement towards making any sort of um, strategic assessment or scenario planning a mandatory element. Um, and what they repeatedly say is that they have this tool, they are just interested in jurisdictions and regions having the ability to get better information to consider outcomes that they think we should consider. But what we do with it is up to us. Whether we engage in it, in it or not is up to us. Um, to your point about whether it would be by jurisdiction or regional, we would really be doing this as a regional MPO-wide um, assessment of strategies and um, information input into the update of the federal plan. But certainly we can run different strategies that might reflect different perspectives. Like we did when we did the scenario yes. planning. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, Franny and then Commissioner Farr. Um, Paul, th th just a question. Th it sounds like it's a <clears throat> planning level tool that can be, or model, and it wouldn't be appropriate at all for like a project, even a large project that has alternatives that um, had modes that were served in different ways. Kelly, I think you might think, correct me. But. I think you're right, it was the regional perspective, and it's actually built up the MPO geography, and so to get to a project too, level. Too great, you can't go It would be too great. Okay. okay. And I believe I've specifically heard that question at some statewide meetings where they said, yeah. no, it's not <coughs> applicable to a project. Okay, thank we you. We do have the, you know, the land use and travel models that would be better suited for that okay. project analysis. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Mr. Park. Thanks. You know, Paul, that's a great summary that you provided for Mayor Lundberg. Uh, that kind of a wrap around the question that I was asking about where does this fit into a greater strategic plan? And if it's inside the greater strategic plan or the uh, regional planning pro effort, um, it's not a, not a new program, but it's potentially uh, some guidance toward how the, other, how the regional planning effort may look and how it may shape up. Uh, and I'm looking at Nate from Kalapuya High School in the back. Thanks for being here, Nate. Kalapuya, by the way, is a great high school in Bethel District. Uh, <laughs> I attend their graduation every year. Nate's going to be walking this year, so good job, Nate. Uh, but I, I just wanted to make certain that people, uh, particularly Nate, understood what this was. It's a part of a planning effort, a greater planning effort. And my question was um, the regarding the metros, uh, the, the process that Metro went through previous to this. Did any large projects come out of their process? Um, that we can identify, you know, for instance, uh, in the last few years, they've opened the Tillicum Crossing, was, uh, which is an alternate modes crossing uh, just south of the Ross Island Bridge, uh, just upstream from the Ross Island Bridge. Um, so did, did the effort, did the, uh, did the process that they went through, the, um, the strategic assessment exercise that they went through, did it result in any, uh, any tangible um, changes to the regional planning effort that they were going through that have created projects that we can identify? I would say yes, most significantly what has happened in Metro um, as a result of, to some extent, their scenario planning, which in, uh, at a very high level indicated that their most effective tool for reaching their goals was transit and their greatest need was funding, that they are now focused on what they're calling the Southwest Corridor Transit Project, uh, essentially um, paralleling Barber Boulevard, I-5 south from the downtown to the Tigard area, to Alton area. Uh, and they are working on developing funding for that. They've both uh, been working that at the state level. It was part of the HB 2017 request, and they're also going to be putting forth 
presumably, it's not formal yet, but presumably um, putting forth a transit ballot measure to fund that project. That is all uh, largely a result of the effort that you know, was engaged in with the scenario planning work. So it identified needs and potential uh, uh, ways to fulfill the needs for the Southwest Corridor in particular. It, it identified that the way that they could get to the future they wanted, the scenario they wanted most effectively was increased transit. Yeah. And then the specific projects came from that. Okay, and not to belabor that, but it might include rail, for instance, or? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Nate, what we're doing here is we're uh, looking at ways to uh, improve alternate means of transportation and make it more convenient for people and make it easier for us to get around without getting in our cars and drive. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? This generation gets it, I can even say it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, the, uh, you pointed out Metro. Uh, it's, because so I've talked to Craig Dirksen quite a bit about this, and uh, you know, Craig comes as a former mayor now a metro, metro uh, counselor. And I think because it is metro, and which metro is so much, it's a large, large, it's three counties in a sense. And so um, and so I think that when you talk scenario planning, it's not so, it's not just all about Portland. It's talking about, it's it's what can be done encompassing Clackamas County, Washington County, the whole area. And uh, it's kind of interesting when you talk to him about it, the uh, when you first saw it on the surface, it you had folks really pushing it for the environmental aspect, the greenhouse gases. But then it moved to uh, somewhat of an economic development tool, and um, and I think that that's where I think the strength of Washington and Clackamas County being a part of that has taken it just from one single area of, of Multnomah County in Portland to all of a sudden that entire region. And the uh, so they use the tool. I think in a in a positive way, knowing that it that they were required, but the, they were they, uh, to me talking to Craig and get really getting in in depth about it. Um, it was pretty creative, to be honest with you, and and how they took it from where you would think that this was just Portland centric to covering this entire region and what it what it did for the entire region. So it's pretty interesting that to, uh, to Mayor Lumberg, I think it, her point though, the making sure it's voluntary and I appreciate that that your comment on that, Paul. But I think this could be a really useful tool <coughs> as we look out over the next, especially the next three years, the build out of the Night Science Campus with the World Championships coming here. I mean, there's there's some really potential possibilities, especially on the riverfront mm -hmm. and uh, the corridor from Glenwood all the way down to, to E-Web. I mean, that, there's some really uh, interesting potential possibilities here. So. Uh, appreciate it, Ellen. Yeah, playing off that, Sid, when they did the when Metro did the uh, the Max line that was going south east, they had communities fighting over which way or it was going to go. Uh, the first time they had like it was pulling teeth, but then after the success of all the different Max lines, they the one that went to Milwaukee now has just gotten a massive amount of development all along it, which was exactly what they were trying to do. And, uh, and so, yeah, what well, turned out to be a great economic development tool, which leads to my question about this tool. Uh, so I know that it creates uh, population increases and things like that. So how does, it, how does it relate to the economic development aspects of, say, if you did put in a transportation corridor into it, does it talk, does the model do anything to let you know what the economic development aspects of it could be, or is it just population and and transportation needs? I think it can start to look at density, which we might translate a bit to economic yeah. development. It's not an economic, purely economic development tool, but we can look into that. That's a good. I know our yeah. like in our plan, trans our trans plan. Um, it it has um, we have transportation corridors that we want that we've identified that are scheduled to have high mm -hmm. density right in the court right next to the corridor you know the mx to the west and things like that yeah. so it create it, the model creates the population increases its limitations are that it's at the again the regional geography and that makes it a more nimble model that allows us to look at policies like a kind of a higher level than yeah. a, like a corridor specific model and so at a regional level it might have some outputs related to that but not to the fine grade again level of a corridor so if, is it, so if you were to put in, uh, say, an MX corridor, right. 
does it, and say, okay, that's one of the things we identified. Is it identify the population increase that would accompany that? Yeah, what, what you would density at least exactly what, what you would put in is like the service transit service miles, how they're increasing from now until 2035 or however far out you want to go, and then it would anticipate like mode share differences based on those increase increases in transit service miles or um, densification or but the monetary um, level of outputs I'd have to look at and there are other tools I don't I, again echoing what Kelly's saying there there are really not direct economic development outputs from this model that I'm yeah. aware of but there are other tools there are uh, some federal tools there's a um, a conference specifically focused on transportation and economic development coming up in a couple of months uh, where they're talking about new tools that are out to uh, enable uh, regions to assess that. Um, that's something that we will be looking at in addition to this tool. Yeah, that would be real valuable. They could complement each other quite nicely. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, something to add to that, uh, I'm familiar with other metro areas that have used this tool. As Kelly describes, it's, it's primarily a vehicle mile traveled traffic output, but there's a land use dimension to it all. There's a land use model. So in other metro areas that are trying to develop transit, the land use planners are trying to figure out how much development will occur around these transit areas. And some of them want to make sure they don't miss an opportunity, so they actually establish um, not just maximum densities, but minimum densities. We want to encourage a certain amount of density around these transit centers, for instance, in a metro area. But if they miss the mark, if they set the bar too high in terms of minimum densities, then the, the market conditions won't be ripe. It'll be, the expectation will be too great. So modeling exercises like this can sometimes be used to help land use planners and real estate developers figure out where that magic sweet spot is in terms of how much development will actually be attracted around the transit station, for instance. So it's a very useful tool, very useful. Because it is true, it is one of those cases, build it and they will come, because we've seen it over and over and over again. You know, it's hard to not think about the Central Utah Rail Project and, and the, uh, the land development that took place in places where it would not have happened before. So, you know, Alan's question regarding the economic impact and the, the commercial impact, mm -hmm. obviously it can't be ignored. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty big. I the first thing I thought it was the Utah project. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So, Paul, I guess it's uh, go forward and do good. Okay, we will. I think you've heard the comments and heard the and and we've had we've we've had the comments and the, we've had the discussion and the comments at the staff level. The staff will continue to monitor this uh, on behalf of all of your jurisdiction, but we will start working with ODOT and DLCD to move forward. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item five, and that is the Oregon Transportation Commission vacancy again. So that one really is me. I, I yeah. Um, oh, it is Paul. Yes, it is. <laughs> so you may be getting tired of hearing this, but there's an opening on the Oregon Transportation Commission. All the time. Um, the commissioner from the Rogue Valley area resigned about two and a half weeks ago, effective immediately. And so at this time, um, I'm not aware that there's been any process announced. Uh, I'm going to be connecting with ODOT staff again either today or tomorrow to see if there is a formal application period and when that may be. Um, as you know, the last several times that there's been an opening, we have encouraged one or more applicants from this area and we have asked not only this body but the Lane Area Commission on Transportation to endorse not only the applicant but the need to have representation from this area. We have not had representation from this metropolitan area since uh, Mr. Pape was on the commission. Um, it's very important that we do. And so we again are hoping that uh, you will consider uh, giving us direction to be able to support both any applicants that may come forward, and I have several names that have come to the top and I'm willing to share those names, and also uh, a general letter really stressing the need to have representation from this area. So I, I am actually asking, maybe not for formal action, but as I have in the past, head nods around approval 
to have letters of support both generally for representation and for any specific applicants should there be an application process. You have a question now? I do, if, if I can. Paul, you pointed out something that's very obvious. We don't have representation from this area, the second largest metropolitan area in the state, and we haven't for a long time. Um, so I remember a couple of years ago when I was uh, when I was chair of the uh, MPC, um, we submitted uh, Jerry Gatos's name back then, yes. and uh, and it was snubbed. <laughs> I'll call it nothing but snubbed. Uh, but uh, it's, so it's important that whatever we do this time, that we get really a full rally behind it, uh, and and make certain that uh, uh, I guess uh, lobbying the governor is probably a. Uh, uh, an appropriate tool is that uh, the, the governor ultimately yeah. makes the appointment so yes talking to the governor talking to uh, her appointments staff mm -hmm. uh, right now her transportation advisor position is vacant if you're not aware of that Carmen Four resigned from that position um, and also talking frankly to uh, ODOT leadership and the Oregon Transportation Commission chair would be useful in terms of helping the governor perhaps appoint a representative from this area. Is that Tammy Bainey the chair? Tammy Bainey is currently the chair. My understanding is that she is interested in and supportive of a representation, representative from our area, yes. she, that she's actually stated that. So I think we need to follow up on that. Um, you mentioned Jerry Gatos. That's one of four names that I've heard mentioned this time around. The last two times there were openings, uh, we had Mayor Piercy specifically applying, and this body and the Lane Act supported Mayor Piercy. We have reached out to her already this time, and she has indicated she's willing to apply again. So, uh, again, there's not been an application period open, but assuming that there is, she's indicated she's willing to apply. Um, and then I will just come right out and say that uh, two other names mentioned so far have been um, Gary Wildish and Commissioner Lycan. Sid Lycan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The, uh, you know, I'm going to say the last time I asked the governor something was about for something. Specifically, I whispered in her ear when she was down here, I asked for half a million dollars for a project, for uh, a housing project for women with children. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Last week she gave it to us. So, or she asked the, uh, this, a couple of weeks ago, she asked um, ways and means to give it to us. And they did. So I can whisper again. <laughs> I'm on a roll. That works. A roll of one. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Mayor. Mayor Lumber. <laughs> so for us to advocate that we would need to settle on somebody, otherwise we're going to be <laughs> whispering different names to <laughs> folks and I, don't, I wouldn't um, advocate for that, that we should have one person that comes to the surface that we would write a letter like we did for um, Kitty in the past. and. Or Jerry, or some, you know, whomever it is, you know, whomever it is, is we're on the same page. So what's the timing, and and how can we have some sort of a process that identifies somebody then? Again, there's no timing that I'm aware of. I don't know if Franny knows anything more, but this just broke. Literally, um, the resignation was announced, like I said, two and a half weeks ago, and it was effective immediately. Caught, I think, even ODOT by surprise. Um, I reached out at the end of last week and there was no planning for a time frame yet. Uh, I've been out of town until late last night, so I'm planning to reach out again later today or tomorrow to see if they've decided on a timeline or a process. In the past, there has been an application process. One of the reasons that I mentioned a generic letter for uh, supporting representation from this area is because we may have multiple applicants and we may want multiple applicants because we don't know what the governor is looking for. We don't know what that person um, selected need, what qualities, what you know, what positions, what you know, what that person needs to bring to the table for the governor to select a person from this area. Uh, there's very few constraints on the governor, other than you can't have an unbalanced political party representation on the commission. And right now, there's two Republicans and two Democrats, so the open seat can be either a Republican or a Democrat. Last time there was an opening, it had to be a Democrat, and thus Mayor Piercy made a lot of sense, at least from that perspective. This time, that constraint isn't uh, isn't in play. So, um, you know, whatever this body directs, we will we will support obviously and send our support up to the governor and the commission and ODOT, but. Uh, I was hoping for direction for not only the generic letter support, but also for any candidate because, you know, I don't think we would have 
a bad candidate from this area. I think we have a number of good names that have come up, and I'd like to see us have a, a field that gives us the best chance at any of them being selected. I'll just add to that, Paul. I think having, if we sent up multiple applicants, it would show our seriousness in being one of in being included in that commission. So I think it would work in our favor to have multiple candidates. Alan? Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, and, and by the way, the last uh, OTC commission we had was uh, Frommeyer. Yeah, who, Mark That's Frommeyer. Right. And uh, uh, it was a couple, just a couple of years ago. And by the way, just as a side note, uh, Arkimoto, uh, Mark Frommeyer's company, just went on NASDAQ on Tuesday, and they were, their whole picture of them sitting at the, at the bell opening was up on the Times Square billboard at NASDAQ, uh, which I got from a uh, 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 picture of it. It's pretty cool. Local company done good. But, but I agree that having multiple candidates is probably not a bad idea. Shows seriousness. And if I could right now, I, I don't know where, what, I, what I, I'm thinking of. If I decide to apply, then I think it'd be very appropriate to have Mayor Venice sign a letter and not me. I, th I think that that's my, my opinion. I think it'd be make, make more sense to have the vice chair sign the letter and not me as, as chair right now. So I just want to make that clear. And um, But at, at this point in time, got, I've got a lot on my plate as it is, but who knows. So. And, and uh, you know, I will add to that that, uh, again, I expect that if there's an application process, Mayor Piercy will apply again. Um, one of the other things that I'm aware of that um, Chair Bainey indicated was that in addition to being interested in a representative from the southern Willamette Valley from our area, uh, she also has indicated that the coastal area is not represented and, of course, being a county commissioner that touches on the coast, <laughs> Commissioner Lichen would have that advantage perhaps. So. Again, the multiple applicant thing may be appropriate. This is the most populous coastal county. It is. <laughs> yep, it is. Hmm. What about Lincoln? Newport, and you'll be that'll this will be on the act agenda next week then. Yeah, well, it's not on the agenda, but I will be bringing it to the meeting. Yes. Next. So. Um, are there so Paul I think on a process point of view so you're gonna you're gonna make contact with ODOT staff kind of see where the process is right now and um, and then depending on where the process you can send an email out I think to the members so we know what the the thought is and then decisions can be made potentially at the next meeting is that what you're thinking or, or what's your thoughts right now my concern is that this could move quicker than our next okay. meeting. And so if it moves quicker than our next meeting a month from now, I mean, it, it's very possible that they could open an application period tomorrow and have it close in two or three weeks. Yeah. And okay. so I would appreciate, um, a, again, approval, formal action if you want, or just head nods, that we send letters of support, both generically and applicant specific, from this area okay. and from this body. Alan. Yeah, I was gonna suggest the same thing. Yeah. Because it could move really quickly and at least get in the uh, letter that says we want somebody from our area because yeah. we're due. Yeah. And then would we send a letter supporting every single applicant individually? Is that what I'm hearing? I would appreciate that. I think the more the better. Uh, and again, I think Commissioner Lichen is correct that if he chooses to apply, I would ask Vice Chair Venice to sign all of those letters, one or more. So a motion would be good then. So I, I move approval that uh, that Paul drafted two letters, a generic and a specific to particular candidates letter, uh, to be forwarded to the uh, be to the OTC. Uh, we typically submit it to the to governor's the appointees, uh, staff, and then CC several other parties, like the OTC, the OTC, and ODOT director Garrett. Second, address appropriately. Okay, thank you. Okay, motion and a second for the discussion. You know, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Lane is more populous than all other coastal counties combined. So. Really? I'll make a note of that. They're all small. Yeah. <coughs> okay, next item is Eugene Springfield's Safe Routes to School program, and it is not Paul. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it actually said. 
I know, right. I know. Well, I like this. I like this. I'm just going to put blind. Yeah, it's usually working. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone. My name is Carolyn Chase. I work with Point to Point at LTD, and I'm lucky enough to work with Safe Routes to School. Um, I want to thank the MPC for years now. MPC has um, awarded our program funding that has been one of the main funding sources to let, that lets our program do what we do. The intention of my presentation today is to let you know what our program is currently doing, but more importantly, to let you know what our plans are for the future, and then to answer any questions you all might have about um, what we're doing today and what we plan to be doing tomorrow. So Safe Routes to School is a movement. It's a movement because 50 years ago, about one in two students walked or biked to school, and today that number is one in six. And this has had real consequences for the health and safety of our children. So the Surgeon General recommends that, that children get up to 60 minutes of, or 60 minutes of physical activity each day. Today, 78% of children mm -hmm. fall short of that. Walking or biking to and from school could go a huge way in helping students, children meet these requirements. Exercise in the morning can help students get to school focused and ready to sit in their chair and learn. Community, children walking and biking to school lets them meet other children, meets, lets them meet their neighbor. And we all know that the more drivers understand and recognize and um, anticipate that they are going to see walkers and bikers when they walk when they drive down certain streets they're going to start predicting and anticipating those users of the roads and they'll be more aware and respond to those users <coughs> so safe routes to school is a national movement there are also statewide movements and there are local efforts so Eugene, Safe, Eugene Springfield Safe Routes to School is a regional partnership, a local, a local um, initiative. It's a partnership between um, Eugene 4J School District, Bethel School District, and Springfield Public Schools. We have embedded Safe Routes to School coordinators in each of these districts. Regional coordination is done through point to point, so that's my position. I work half time doing this job. That embeddedness of the Safe Routes to Schools coordinator is what is something we consider a huge strength of the partnership. So because these coordinators are in their school, they have access to the schools, access to the staff. <coughs> funding, so our funding is through MPO discretionary funds. ODOT has been a huge partner and um, recently has been very helpful in launching the Springfield Safe Routes to School program. Also, the Jane Higdon Foundation has provided um, recurring um, funds that help pay for bike and pedestrian safety education. Our Safe Routes to School program focuses on programs in the five E's, so education, encouragement, engineering, enforcement, and evaluation. And then there's a six E, equity, that really informs our programs, our, all of our programs. Equity is important because low-income people are twice as likely to be killed while, while walking. African-American children are twice as likely to be killed as walk, while walking as white children, and Latino Americans are 40% more likely than white Americans. Our reach and our impact. So this chart shows bicycle and pedestrian safety education. We provide bicycle um, safety education in the fifth or sixth grade, and we provide pedestrian safety education in the second grade. And as you can see, over the last three years, we've been, been able to reach about 2,500 students each year. This means about 50% of, um, of fifth or sixth graders are receiving bicycle safety education and just about 50% of second graders are receiving pedestrian safety education. In encouragement events, so maybe you've seen walk and roll events around um, 
advertised around our community. So walk and roll events are typically twice a year. So there's a big event in October, another big event in May. And um, these, what this graph shows is school participation. So the number of schools that have participated um, academic year after academic year. Where our program is moving is um, continuing to do these big campaigns twice a year, but also introducing year-round encouragement events. So walking Wednesdays, walking school buses, trying to move towards this continuous um, encouragement of these activities that are so healthy for kids. So recently, our partnership put out a strategic plan, and the strategic plan is incredibly important for a partnership like ours that has um, people working in different organizations, so it helps focus our efforts. So the strategic plan is to take us into 2021, and it has identified goals and objectives that we plan on meeting. And um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about HB um, 2017. There are some funds specific to Safe Routes to School Infrastructure, and our program is gearing up to um, be able to put in strong applications for those funds. So some of the major initiatives from that strategic plan are to expand bicycle and pedestrian education, to grow the number of schools participating in walk and roll events, to inventory and prioritize infrastructure deficiencies around all schools, and we plan on doing that by the end of 2019. Creating a comprehensive crossing guard program regionally and establishing an advisory committee. And we've already gone a long ways to accomplishing many of these goals. So HB 2017 sets aside specific funds that are going to pay for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure improvements around schools, so within one mile of schools. There's going to be $10 million annually, and that's going to increase to $15 million annually by 2023. The inventory and prioritization work that our program is doing is going to help put forward the best, the best projects for these funds. And again, like I said, our goal is to complete these inventories by 2019. We work very closely with the different jurisdictions and their planners and engineers um, towards this goal. So I talked about an advisory committee. So an advisory committee has been um, put together. We met first November of last year, and the focus of that was going through our strategic plan so that it was ready to be finalized. And then we met again just this February, and the focus there was looking at how we could expand our bicycle and pedestrian education program. We see that program as one of the um, most direct impacts we have on children. So these program, the bicycle and pedestrian education program, it teaches kids how to cross the road safely, the basics of helmet fitting, how to position yourself on the road, how to let drivers know your intentions, and eye contact, the rules of the road, and best of all, these, this education is taught by trained professionals. So um, City of Eugene Riverhouse staff provides a lot of the bicycle and pedestrian education training. Willamma Lane has recently joined as a new partner doing the same thing in Springfield Public Schools. And recently, um, Eugene 4J has been training their uh, teachers on how to do pedestrian safety education in class. So that ends my presentation, and I'd love to entertain any questions you have. I have a lot of members from our Safe Rounds team in the audience as well that can help me answer anything I can't answer. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for the presentation. And, uh, questions? Patty? That was a great presentation. And I'm wondering, are the when you're targeting the schools or when you're working with the schools, do you target every grade equally or are there particular grades for particular activities? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we talked about the education, which targets fifth and sixth grades for bicycle safety education and then second grade for pedestrian education. So that is targeted. Um, Walk and roll and encouragement events have typically been at the elementary and middle school levels, 
And we have been in some high schools for walk and roll events, but um, typically our participation is in the elementary and middle schools. Um, we have been talking as a group on how to involve high schools more, and we recently um, were in the process of finishing an art competition that was just rolled out in the high schools. So, yes, that's your question. Ellen? Yeah, great presentation. Thank you, um, Carolyn. Um, the last bullet on page two talks about new initiatives uh, about the unmet need for crossing guards. Is that is that a, a big problem? Are we having a deficit of people that are volunteering to be, are they volunteers from the first place or do they get? Yeah, so um, I'll answer that question the best I can. And then team, if you want to step in, please help me. So there used to be funding for crossing guards and there is no longer funding for crossing guards. And I don't know the exact history of that. But right now, a lot of the crossing guards that work, they are, um, they are employees at the school that are, have other positions and that are being drawn out of those positions to be crossing guards in the morning and after school hours. Um, obviously, schools don't have resources to take people out of their, other, their otherwise jobs to do this, so it is a problem. And we do have um, schools that cannot provide crossing guards at all the locations where they should be. And I believe we even have some schools that don't have crossing guards at all. So the funding, um, the funding and the training of a crossing guard program has definitely risen as a top concern that we want to address. Yeah, I think that's really important. Actually, I remember my crossing guard when I was a little kid. So I think they're pretty impactful in terms of education and safety as well. Um, two statistics that you put up on the board, I want to make sure I got them right, maybe you could reiterate them. One was about 78% of of kids nationally aren't getting how many it was yeah, 50 so minutes a the day. surgeon general recommends 60 minutes of physical activity per day and 78 percent of children do not get that <laughs> that's wow. startling actually it's only an hour um and then the other statistic was about uh fatalities pedestrian fatalities by by race yes so um the National Safe Routes to School recently put out an equity report focused on these disparities in um, the, the impacts of crashes and how um, the lack of good infrastructure in some communities can really lead to dire consequences. And they found that African American children are twice as likely to be killed while walking as white children. <clears throat> Um, Low-income people are twice as likely to be killed while walking as, um, as non-low-income people. Latino children are 40 percent more likely to be killed while walking than white children. It is staggering. Is that mostly because of infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, like lack of sidewalks? And so it's largely, it's largely infrastructure related. <clears throat> oh, that's another startling statistic. Yeah, thanks. Good work, good, good work, by the way. Thank you. Mayor Lumberg. Um, Two things. So in an infrastructure needs assessment, what all are you looking at? One, is each school in each district going to be assessed? And then what's the, um, you know, you're going out two blocks, you're going out all the way to the school district boundaries. Um, it's, it seems like a big project, so that's one question. So that's a, yes, it is a big project. The funding is available for projects up to one mile around schools. Um, that does not mean that our inventory work is going to go within one mile of all, all schools. Um, what the inventory looks at, first of all, the inventory is, um, it's uniform. So all of the districts are using the same uniform way of um, taking a project through criteria and giving that project a grade. And then that grade is how they're ranked. The inventory looks at issues like safety. What's the speed of the road? Um, is the, uh, what's the speed of the road, the width of the road? Um, what is the particular gap that needs to be addressed? Is it a sidewalk gap? Is it a safe crossing gap? Um, what's the nearest crossing, safe crossing, if it's a, if it's a crossing issue? Um, it looks at equity issues and um, 
important. It looks at um, what other than the school is nearby that that infrastructure, an infrastructure project might support. So are there parks nearby, a library nearby, other, um, other activities that would be drawing pedestrians and um, would let an infrastructure project get more bang for its buck. So it looks at a lot of things. It's a pretty comprehensive, we think it's a pretty comprehensive way of scoring these projects. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I wouldn't because we do have separate money now for yes. bike and head infrastructure projects. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know what we were actually collecting. And then um, I had written data collection on mode of travel. Is that you're just going to do a survey of every student to find out how they're getting back and forth to school so you can make some determinations about the school, X number of kids, bike, you know, I'm thinking, okay, during the spring and maybe fall, you get bike bikers, depending on when you do this mode, is um, you're going to get different answers because you're gonna, you know, in the middle of winter, when it's pouring down rain, you're gonna mark, I get to school via car. That, I guess that, that's what I'm looking for is, because it would be useful information, but yes. how are you going to do that? Yes, well, that's a great question. So yes, there are two main ways Safe Routes to School collects data throughout the year. Um, yearly, we try to do um, what's called a student tally twice a year, in the fall and in the spring. And that asks, you know, a teacher will um, kind of do a, how many kids walk to school? How many kids rode the bus to school? Um, but you're totally right. Things like weather and other things can greatly impact the results we get back. And also, um, you know, whether a school, the, schools are not required to participate. So we are also, um, we are also encouraging schools to participate in things like the student tally, but we can't, we are not at this point, you know, it's not, not something we can require. A second tool we have for collecting information like that is called the parent survey. That's done less frequency, frequently. The recommendation is to do it every three years, and that's a more comprehensive look. It's the parents answering the question, and it looks at things like, um, why are you? Why is your child getting to school the way they are? So, what are their different components that go into decisions around how a student is getting to and from school? So, will it? Will you be able to look at the bus routes too and and determine? Well, these uh, ten kids in this neighborhood could take the bus, but their folks are taking them anyway, and it's because they take orchestra and the more you know, they're you know what yeah. mm -hmm. those kind of yeah, it's because a lot of a lot of kids get to school mm -hmm. because they have to be there before the bus or yes. whatever. The parent survey is the tool that can answer those types of questions. And yes, it does do that because it looks at the distance that a child lives from school, um, their mode of getting to school, and then the reasons around that decision. Um, but like I said, it's not, it's not done every year and it's not even recommended that it be done every year. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Farr. Thanks. <clears throat> Just, I have a couple of things, really. Uh, one is regarding uh, uh, practices, current practices. Um, I would expect that you see what is happening in different school districts around and, and use best practices to uh, try apply them in other schools. I, that's a, I presume that. I, I live uh, near a lot of schools out, uh, Rob Leary sitting back there, and, uh, out in Bethel. And no matter which way I come to work in the morning, I pass a lot of schools. So I have an a chance to observe what the traffic situations are around schools, and really specifically sometimes what the parking is like. So kids are having to weave in and out of parking. And so working with the municipality, uh, at Bethel schools, I happen to live out on the edge of town, um, are, many of them are uh, close to the urban growth boundary, or if not, they're inside the city limits, but still have ditches and not sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so paying attention to how people park along the ditches, along the, uh, the partially improved roads that are st inside the city limits, it's important that we work with the city of Eugene, the city of Springfield, whatever city, to make certain that they are understanding the importance of safety around schools. And you know, parking has, has been a particular issue in, uh, around uh, Willamette High School, Malibon, um, and Cascade. Uh, parking back on the back streets there, where some of them, are, some of them are uh, ditches, and you see kids pushing and not rolling their bikes, trying to ride their bikes and trying to walk up and down in there. So, work, you know, both working with the municipality and also identifying best, uh, best existing 
practices. Uh, Prairie Mountain School, for instance, on uh, Royal Avenue. When, when you're driving toward Prairie Mountain School, when you're about 200 yards away, you know how fast you're going. And it reminds me to slow down. However, when I drive out toward, um, toward um, uh, Meadowview School, there's no such flashing sign that tells me how fast I'm going. So sometimes, as much as I might say I'd love to go at the school, uh, you know, at the uh, appropriate uh, speed for the school, I don't have that reminder. So little things that really are relatively inexpensive remind people to be safe, remind the motorists to be safe, as well as teaching kids motorists have to be controlled and, and taught to be safe also. And I know you're on top of it because I've seen what you've done in, in Bethel and uh, around Irving Elementary, which is one of the, it's a remote school in Bethel. I mean, this, it's a far safer route to school than it was seven years ago. So. Yeah, those are great point, points. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, very good. Excellent presentation. Appreciate it very much. So um, before we move on to the next item, I'm going to ask that the MPC, that this group actually, we reconsider the letter, the OTC letter. And the reason why is I just text Commissioner Bainey. Commissioner Bainey is meeting with the governor tomorrow and asks that we send names up ASAP. Oh. So uh, if you can draft a letter, this my, my suggestion, draft a letter, track down Mayor Venice as soon as you possibly can to sign. But I think because we had a motion before, I think it would be appropriate to have a motion. So she, but that's what uh, she just sent a message back to me and said, send the names up immediately and not just a generic. So by three o'clock? <clears throat> that, that would be the motion. You're typing. I, well, <laughs> we, we, if I may, we have the letters from the previous time, so that's, that's going to be not too difficult to write the letters. Uh, since we're doing specific letters, it sounds like really is more the important point here. Um, I can plug in names, and we have one for Mayor Percy already. Yep. Uh, I understand that she's still interested, so if I am getting multiple letters, Commissioner, am I writing one with your name on it? And I mean, not to put you on the spot, but uh, I can go ahead, add my name to it, whether okay. it happens or not. I, it, like I said, I have plenty on my, my table, but as long as we send up multiple names, I, I think four names like this uh, gives us a, uh, I think it gives us a strong, I think, Patty, I think you said it well, and it gives us a very strong piece from, from our area of, of their strong interest to have be a, where we have an appointment to the, to the commission. I'm just slightly reluctant to send names up if I haven't contacted those people and said that they're okay with that. So I, I you know, that's why I asked you, and I'm perfectly willing to try and call uh, Mr. Wilders and Mr. Gatos and see yeah. if I can reach them also. Yeah. Then I wouldn't send if you didn't. If they didn't yeah. say yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's why. Yeah. If I may, I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect. To that you prefer up to five letters before the end of this day. One generic. Do we need the generic anymore? I guess we don't need the generic no, anymore. She's asking so for specific up to names. up to four letters. Uh, with the approval of the four names that you mentioned, Gary Wildish, Jerry Gatos, um, Sid Lycan, and Kitty Piercy, uh, and to have it done by the end of the day today. We will do our best. do four letters? One for each person? Yeah, well, why don't you send one letter with four names on? That's, that's a good question. Yeah. That's easier. <laughs> All? I mean, it's the same effect. It might look a little bit better, too, because otherwise you have four letters that read it. Yeah, so I, so that leaves exactly I, the I same, agree. right? I would agree with that. Uh, the reason I said that is because you said you already have one with Kitty's name on it. So, and I know we have one from the past with Jerry's name on it. So. Yeah, one letter. Four names. That's my motion. If they agree. If they agree. With up to four names. Okay. Would we want to say and anyone else <laughs> that applies from the metropolitan <laughs> area, just in case there are other applicants that we're not aware of? Because I, th I think Maybe that you know, just approving that at this time, these are the four people. Yeah. 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 I, I would suggest what you, Councillor Zelenka said that at this time, these are the names we are aware are, yeah. uh, are interested in the position. We fully support them, and leave it at that because she's asking for specifics. Yeah. Um, would you add a, a paragraph on the urgency of having somebody from the Upper Willamette Valley? It's or upper? It's lower, 11? Lower. lower. It's upper, uh, lower. It depends on, I guess, upper reach of the river. No. no uh, it's, anyway. It's upper because we're higher in elevation. So. <laughs> that, that language is already in there. That, that language is in the letter. It's recovery. <laughs> the lower Willamette Valley is down by where it goes into Columbia. 
<laughs> that was a nice recovery. Yeah. Well, Southern. That's what I've been told. <laughs> we are higher. I was I was uh, I was admonished for calling this the Upper Willamette Valley one time by somebody who knew. So. So one letter, four names, and any additions. Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. Or at this time, these are the people we know yeah. there. So I. We had a motion last time. Do we want to do a motion again on this one or, or head nods? Head nods, good. Head nods. Head nods, good? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, there's the direction. Yeah, All right. Thank you. All right, now, moving on. Next item is MPO Title uh, Six plan updates. So it is not Paul, it's Ellen. Yes, hello. <laughs> um, this will be pretty brief. I just wanted to give you an update to let you know that we are working on updating our Title VI plan. We create a new plan every three years and we also do an annual report. So this is an actual update to the plan. Our last one was adopted in 2015. We'll bring a draft to you hopefully in May uh, for a, a consideration of adoption in June. And the process that we're going through right now is data collection and what we do is um, primarily look at census data at poverty, disability, uh, minority populations, elderly, people uh, without access to a vehicle, a private vehicle, and we put that onto a map and we look at the ways that our policies might potentially impact what we call these communities of concern. So we're going through that data process, collection process right now and part of that data collection process actually involves um, collecting some of that information about our policy boards. So we will be sending out an email to you and to our um, staff committee just with three questions about how you identify your ethnic, race or ethnicity, gender, and what policy board you um, are a part of. So you'll get that email from me in the next month. It is voluntary um, and each of the questions have an option to not answer, but we encourage you to answer that. It's important data that um, FHWA is interested in when we submit our plan. So don't delete it. <laughs> and it will say Title VI demographic survey in the subject line. Um, it's our, Title VI is our civil rights and environmental justice plan. If you're not familiar with that. They're gonna come from you, Ellen? Either me or the MPO email address, but probably me. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Questions? And just a little clarifying uh, about that, you should probably, if you're the primary person on this board, that's who should answer that question. So if you have people that sometimes fill in, we don't necessarily have to have everybody fill out that. It should be the person who primarily sits on this committee. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, uh, legislative update. So Paul. So there's, Five things that I've bulleted that I want to try and touch on here, and I'm going to talk about um, three of them. I'm going to let other people lead off because I reached out to staff to see if they would help with some updates on the implementation around the, some of the HP House Bill 2017 transportation package items, uh, specifically. Uh, Rob Interfell from the City of Eugene is going to update you on the Safe Routes to Schools implementation, and then uh, AJ from LTD can give us an update on the implementation of the transit funding. So, Rob, if you want to lead off. Sure. Um, I should have told the Safe Routes to School coordinators I was going to be doing this, but oh well, they can learn later. <clears throat> so yeah, we just had a RAC uh, rule making advisory committee meeting this week, and so I thought I'd give you an update <clears throat> on where things are with that. Um, so we're, we're kind of in the final, finalizing the rules that will go out for public review. So there'll be a 21 day public comment period beginning May 1st. <clears throat> and OT, the Oregon Transportation Commission is scheduled to adopt the rules at their July meeting. And <clears throat> there's a lot of interest in really getting the grant program going fast so that ODOT can demonstrate to the legislature that they're serious about spending this money and getting it to communities. So <clears throat> there are the idea is to have this, the information, the solicitation for the grant program beginning at the end of July with letters of intent due in late August and applications due October 15th. And then with the idea that um, the OTC would approve the grant recommendations from ODOT at their February 21st, 2019 meeting and they'll be Oh, that I'll be creating a new version of the rulemaking advisory committee I'm on that's more of a, law, a standing Sabre to School advisory committee, and that'll make recommendations to that and the OTC, to the OTC, I guess, on what 
projects get funded. <clears throat> As you may remember from previous meetings, the, um, the legislature had a 40% match requirement for these funds, which is super high, but they created three exceptions. One is if it's a Title I school, which is more than half the schools in the state. The second is if it's a city of less than, in a city of less than 5,000 people. And third is if the project's on a safety corridor, which is being defined through the rulemaking. And um, ODOT, one of the things ODOT's doing is they're gonna be holding workshops around the state to uh, inform people from communities about how the grant program works. And so they're, they're tentatively scheduled to have one on the afternoon of August 8th in Springfield. I think they're working, they're working with Loudon, the Sa Springfield Safe Routes of School Coordinator to find a site at a Springfield school to hold the workshop. And that's the, that evening is the, is the August Act meeting. So I think the hope was there could be some synergies there. And something else is that high schools are eligible for the Safe Routes of School funding, but um, the, the House bill calls out elementary and middle as a higher priority. So something we talked about at the RAC meetings is that high school projects could potentially get funded, but they would have to be um, more, maybe more compelling, more of a safety concern than maybe a, an, another project at a middle or elementary school. There's also a possibility that the first round of funding might only be Title I schools, that something that we've talked about at the RAC meeting. And then only projects, then all the projects would have 20% match requirement. In terms of the funding amount, what, what ODOT's forecasting is 18, a little over 18 million for the first round in 1920. I'm not quite sure why, but 30 million for 21-22, even though I know it's still only 10 million a year, so I'm not sure how that pl works out that way. But, and then the, the round after that would be, would be 30 million. So it's every, um, it would be every other year would be, the, would be the funding. And I think that's pretty much all I have. So are there any questions about that? Ready? Was there any uh, discussion about interaction with the MPC or the Act? Not in any formal way, but certainly like we can continue to have updates. There, I don't think they're going to be looking for recommendations the way we say for Connect Oregon, but the two, two of the groups that they would be looking to have recommendations from are the, um, I don't know if I have the correct name of this, but the Safety Committee the government, it's the Governor Safety Committee and the um, Oregon Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, they would, their recommendations would feed into the Safe Routes of School Advisory Committee. Any other questions? So, you know, I, I guess I'd say that um, this money, this, this program is gonna be super competitive, so hopefully we can put our best projects forward in our three school districts. And, you know, one, projects can be dispersed too. They don't, you know, one, you could have like a bunch of pedestrian crossing enhancement that's at a bunch of schools. It doesn't have to be a project necessarily at one school site. We've also talked about the range of um, how much could be applied for, and I think we're talking around between like roughly around 70,000 to up to 2 million per application. And one thing to keep in mind too is these are state funds, so they're not all the, the it's a lot easier for local, for cities to spend state funding than federal funding. It's just like there's a lot less red tape and it's, um, they can be, they can be, it can just be a lot quicker. And so this is like a good kind of money to get to build projects. Um, when we used to get funds from ODOT's bicycle and pedestrian grant program, which no longer exists, that was state funding. And it was, it was super easy to work with compared to the federally funded projects. Patty? Um, just to clarify that. 40% match is for all the big rich people, but is there a little, is there a 20% match for the rural communities or the Title IX schools? Is there- uh, Not rural, but cities of 5,000 or fewer. So it's kind of interesting because rural communities that are unincorporated wouldn't qualify for that, but most of them are probably Title I anyway, so. But is there a match required? Yes, there's always a minimum of at least 20%. Now, something, but just to add something else is like one of the things that ODOT, ODOT can apply for funds too, and so they may also be looking to partner with rural communities where there's an ODOT facility that could be where the project could either be on the ODOT road or in a parallel facility if that makes more sense for the investment to be in a parallel, parallel facility to the ODOT facility. And then ODOT would be able to bring match forward for that. Um, Rob was there, and I may have missed this. Is there any um, kind of percentage allocated to this metropolitan area or to any metropolitan areas, or is it just the big pot of money, 70000 to $2 million per application, and whoever gets it gets it? Right. 
Now, one thing we have talked about is creating a target for um, rural communities. And what we define as rural for the, for the purposes of this is non, well, this is in the proposed rules, is non-MPO. For anything out, so anything outside of MPO would be considered rural. And I think around a quarter of the state's population is, would be, meet that definition of rural. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rob. So the next update would be on the uh, stiff or, or transportation, public transportation transit funding that has three components to the statewide funding that was implemented in HB 2017. 90% um, of the funding that's being collected through the employee payroll tax is formula funding that goes to uh, transit operators such as Lane Transit District. The remaining 10% is divided actually into three more pots, technically. 5% uh, AJ, correct me if I got this wrong, but 5% is for the uh, statewide discretionary grant funding. 4% is for what they're now calling inter-community or inter-city competitive grant funding. And then 1% is for technical assistance, uh, an ODOT technical assistance center. You got so AJ, if you could take it from there. Sure. So tell you guys a little bit about where we're at. So the Rules Advisory Committee, we uh, completed our draft. So the latest information is as of March 28th, um, uh, notice uh, was filed with the Oregon Secretary of State and from April 1st to the 21st, there's the public comment on the draft rules that we've uh, finalized. Uh, on April 17th, there will be a public hearing and on June 22nd, OTC uh, meeting will be held to consider the draft rules. Um, with the goal of everything going to, into effect as of July 1st, 2018. Uh, a change in this last legislative session was that uh, originally the funds would not be, uh, the projects would not be eligible for funding until January 1st of 2019, uh, but that has changed. So. Um, agencies who are able to uh, put everything together may be able to use the projects that we're scheduled to submit in um, October, November deadline and ask for money retroactively. So if we have projects that were el eligible, we could recoup that money. And that is because uh, different jurisdictions wanted the ability to implement uh, projects like low income fair program, student programs, um, sooner than later, and then they would not have been eligible for reimbursement during that period that they had implemented. Um, I can go into the purpose of it, how the, I think you told them how the funding is broken down, and um, at a future date, maybe we can come back and tell you as to where LTD is with our process. At our last SPC meeting, we had a lengthy discussion about our advisory committee and the makeup of it, and could we use the SPC and how with a committee, which is a strategic planning committee, to fulfill that role, being that a lot of the members are already eligible. So we're in the process of putting draft rules for an advisory committee, and um, also uh, determining how to come back and reach out to the rural areas, because the funding that LTD will be managing as the um, qualified entity for Lane County um, it also includes rural transit agency. So we want to make sure that we're doing that in a responsible way and we'd be happy to provide you an update at a late date and full presentation as where we're at. Um, there is no provision for Lane Act to play a role except informational, but the next Lane Act I, I will be providing kind of an update as to where we're at with the process and where LTD is at. So they did ask for a presentation and we can do one here as well. And I'd be happy to send out a link uh, this afternoon to what was just put out for the public comment period. It has a very good summary of the rulemaking and the, and the funds, the detailed rulemaking if you want to read through it, and then the opportunities for comment. So I can send a link out to that. Uh, There's also a nice little two-pager that gives you a quick summary of everything in case anybody asks questions. A quick two-page summary gives you a snapshot of what it is. Very good. Questions for AJ? Seeing none? Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to move on to the third bullet point I have, which is something out of the 18 short session that just ended 
a little bit ago. Um, as I've let you know in previous updates, there wasn't a lot of tremendous significance in the short session with respect to MPO priorities. But one of the things that did happen um, through HB 4063 is the establishment of an autonomous vehicle task force. That task force is statewide to start advising uh, the legislature on how to prepare for the future with autonomous vehicles. Um, it established a 31 member task force. Um, two of the members are from the Senate, two of the members from the House of Representatives, and then the ODOT director appoints the other 27 members. Um, and I, they've been appointed, so this is, well, I'm not asking for letters of support here. <laughs> One each. The, so, but the news here is that one of those 27 seats is an MPO representative, and that person is a Portland Metro staff person who is a recent hire by Metro specific to autonomous vehicles and new technology. That is his job. So he will be representing um, all of the Oregon MPOs with that position on this task force. Um, we're going to have a presentation by him for including him at the Oregon MPO Consortium meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. I can certainly provide more information for you uh, at our next meeting. Another uh, seat out of those 27 is a representative from the um, Association of Oregon Counties, and that representative is sitting here at the table, Commissioner Lichen, is on the AV task force. So we will have a couple of uh, avenues of keeping you updated. The first task force meeting is in a week or two, two weeks, I think. So April 16th. <laughs> so it's coming right up. So by your next meeting, we'll have a little more information. Just to give you a real quick summary, the task force has essentially been established for nearly two years. And somewhere in here, I'm trying to find my notes. In the first year, they're supposed to focus on and provide a report to the 19 legislature on licensing, registration, law enforcement, accidents, cybersecurity, insurance, and liability. And then the second year gets into uh, the task force coming up with a report to the legislature in 2020 on land use, infrastructure, public transit, workforce impacts, and other state responsibilities. So there's a lot to tackle in two years. Uh, I just thought I'd let you know that we've got a member of the, another new task force and more to, more to come on that. I drew the short straw. <laughs> you could send an autonomous person. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A, robot. a virtual person. Show them from Big Bang Theory, you know, on TV. I don't know if there's any questions or, Commissioner, you want to add anything to that? No, I, it'll be interesting, I, especially statewide. Uh, you know, you get a county like Mau here, a county that has the most county uh, county road miles in the state with, I think, uh, what's the population? 5,000 people maybe, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it'll, be, uh, it'll be interesting uh, hearing from colleagues on the east side and their thoughts on this because the, uh, but if you read about the state of Ohio, they're actually pretty further far along on this and to the point where they're working with the idea of autonomous semis, uh, autonomous trucks. And uh, like Franny and I have talked, had those conversations about that and what that means and where that's going to be in the future. Um, so I, I think it's interesting that the, at least the task force has been established and it's really up to the legislature and the governor if this is something that they want to pursue or not. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it just from a, a county perspective of what this all means and where we go from here. So at least there's a trim lean task force. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only 31. The other local link I'll mention, I, you know, again, we, we talked earlier about the um, strategic assessment providing some information on autonomous vehicles, perhaps uh, this task force. And then the third link I'll mention is that the University of Oregon Sustainable Cities Initiative Program has reached out to us at Alcog, has reached out to the MPO, and they're interested in partnering with us in looking at um, developing policies in our new long range plan, the RTP that I was mentioning earlier, that might help uh, guide us towards the future of you know, having autonomous vehicles both on the transportation system and with respect to urban form. So again, um, just 
another possibility where we can have a partner in developing the next long range plan. Uh, they've got, you know, obviously uh, a lot of interest in this and, and students that might help us like they did on the uh, scenario planning process that we went through. Okay. Any, any, Anything else on that? Anything else on the, on the update? Uh, yeah, there are two more, real quick. <laughs> um, so, just on the federal level, I will mention quickly, and um, I'm not going to get into details here. Commissioner Likens sent me a very nice summary two days ago, and there's been other summaries I've seen. But you, you're probably aware that there was a new federal budget passed. That federal budget was pretty significant in terms of not being another, you know, 10 or 30 day continuing resolution, but an actual longer term, relatively longer term budget. And it actually increased transportation funding in a whole bunch of areas. Um, again, I'm not gonna try and get into the details, but it increased uh, the funding for the Tiger Grant program. It increased funding for road and bridge projects. Uh, it increased funding for planning, research, and development. Um, it did continue funding for Amtrak and rail safety and uh, transit formula grants consistent with existing authorization levels. Unfortunately, it did nothing for high speed rail. It continued to punt on that. Um, if anybody's interested, I can forward the summary and uh, there's a lot of information out there. More to come on that as those programs start to get implemented or that, that money starts to roll out, if you will. Uh, the last thing on the legislative update is just to let you know that it's time to start looking forward to the 2019 long session. So I plan on this body's agenda next month to bring to you the legislative priorities document that you approved leading up to the 2017 session and use that as a starting point for discussion around legislative priorities around transportation for 19. Uh, we'll be doing the same thing at the NPO consortium in about two weeks. So as the NPO consortium tries to come up with statewide priorities, for the 19th session, you'll need to do that for this body um, also. Uh, you know, presumably, you'll still want to advocate for funding for some of the priority projects, such as Beltline, like we did in 2017. But I'm just going to use those, those uh, priorities from the last time as a jumping off point for, for the new priorities. Questions for Paul? Okay, good update. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next item then is follow up and next steps. ODOT, any uh, updates? Yeah, I have a couple updates. Um, can I pass those, I can pass those out? Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the fact that the Beltline project is completed, the interchange at I 5. We wow. finished the last phase, and the last thing we put up was an informational sign that um, was uh, over Beltline Road by Cobur near Coburg Road. So it kind of identifies information for the driver as to what, you know, if there's a wreck ahead or if there's congestion ahead, et cetera. So it's an ITS sign, they're called. Um, but part of that um, celebration is the fact that we also have a new bicycle path that's along I-5 on the west side of I-5 that connects the, the North Harlow area to the Coburg Road and the, um, so it extends that connection and opens up a lot more um, access for folks. So on May 19th, which is a Saturday at 11, the city of Eugene and ODOT is gonna do a little um, opening celebration for that bike path. And um, I want to, we'll send out invitations to everyone about that and um, we're, we're hoping that people will join us, that we'll be inviting the community, the general neighborhoods as well as the businesses along that corridor and that would be served by that bicycle path. Um, safe routes to schools. We're going to invite the uh, bike share folks that have the new bike share program at the university to be able to show off their bikes as well. So invitations will be coming out soon. I also hope to do an article in the Register Guard about the Beltline project. It was a long time coming and it had a lot of improvements, uh, mainly for the city of um, Springfield, but also of course for Eugene. Um, and so that's so exciting. And then next, um, we're gonna have a very, very, very busy construction season in 18, 19, et cetera. And I just kind of handed out a map showing what is gonna be happening 
Um, the good news is, is we're getting our infrastructure up to um, speed for the 20, 2021 games. The bad news is, is it's going to be like game day every day this summer. <laughs> so, um, sorry. Um, but we have been trying to anticipate this and working with the City of Eugene, Lane County about their um, projects that are also coming up for construction. And um, we had a meeting with the project managers, uh, the, the project planners, and the, the project managers that are going to be overseeing the contracts, talking about um, the various projects that are going to be going on. Um, we had the public information officers at that same meeting. So what we're planning is lots and lots of information going out to the community, getting that information. Everybody go to trip check, find out what road is open and what's closed. The good news is another the paving um, on Beltline that's going to be going from the um, UPRR bridge all the way through to almost I-5 will be at night and one lane at a time as far as we can tell unless a contractor comes forward with a different proposal, but that's what our expectation is. So 18 busy, um, so I just kind of wanted to give you a heads up about that. We'll be, um, there'll be lots of public service announcements and information going out about that, but um, hoping people will use different modes of transportation <laughs> in the summer. And by the way, LTD is also involved in those uh, LTD operations specifically so that they know what's coming. So that is what I have. All right. Uh, next is Springfield Main Street safety update. I don't know whether or not. Okay. Yes, I have. I have some very exciting news to share. After uh, over a year, at long last, we have a contract in place with the consultant. So we'll begin the, be beginning work on that soon. My understanding is uh, Springfield City staff will be uh, briefing the city council on this. It's sometime in May, I believe. So we're excited to get started. It's uh, been a long time in getting the contract together, as you know. It's been complicated. It's a $715,000 contract with the consultant, plus o ODOT is very pleased to be able to reimburse the city for a portion of your staff time expenses. We, um, about 60% of your total cost, uh, $200,000. So it's a big ticket project. It's, uh, it'll take about two years to get through, but we're ready to get started. All right, uh, next is rail update. I don't know if we have an update on rail or... Not aware of any at this time. Okay. Uh, OMPOC update. Uh, just briefly, as I mentioned, the uh, Oregon MPO Consortium is meeting, I guess, three weeks from tomorrow um, on the 27th in Grants Pass. Um, so we have on there the 2019 legislative priorities, the Autonomous Vehicle Task Force, a number of other items. The agenda is, I think the draft agenda is actually posted at the OMPOC website, it is. So um, just letting you know, and Mayor Lundberg is one of your representatives, and are, are you both able to attend? I believe I can go. Good. Very good. Good. Right. Uh, Lane Act update. We were did not have an Act meeting last month, so anything you want to add? Uh, here's a brief summary of what we'll be talking about next week on April 11th. Um, we will be talking about the ODOT ADA settlement agreement. We have a speaker from ODOT coming down, Lisa Strader. We'll be uh, talking about the statewide transportation improvement fund. Laura Jackson just referred to that. She'll be at the meeting to provide a summary for the act. Uh, we'll be providing a STIP update focusing on the uh, new program guidelines for the leverage program. Uh, following that, the next meeting would be on May 9th. Very good. And have the attachment on the MTIP administrative amendments, and then we'll work on the agenda for any questions. Please let me know. So at this time, and so LTD and Coburg do not need to. So do I do I uh, adjourn this meeting and then call the cable commission to order? Is that that's appropriate, that's appropriate. and that we're moving on to a All different right. the cable yep. commission specific. Okay, so we'll adjourn the NPC meeting and uh, allow those who are not part part of this to get back to their work. And um, so we'll just uh, wait here for a couple minutes and then I'll we'll call the. Uh, and this will take. Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. This will take two minutes. We can move from MPC to MCC. I'm just finishing. Oh. Bill. Oh.
Can I get one of those maps? Give me that. Thank you. You can. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and call the Metropolitan Cable Commission meeting to order. And um, so we just have one item, public education government grant program. And Ann's not here, so I'm assuming you're taking it, Paul. Yeah, I got delegated to this time. All right. Um, and just wanted you to be aware, and it's in your memo in the packet, that um, the Metropolitan Cable Commission has directed over the past several years to build up a reserve to cover City Hall uh, costs for the signal collection system. Now that that, has, that reserve target has been met, uh, there is a current year uh, round of funding, the full $50,000 available to distribute, and the uh, opportunity for funding was noticed. The application period actually closed yesterday, and so at your meeting next month, uh, the Cable Commission staff will be bringing a recommended ranking of the applications for funding to you for your consideration. This is just a heads up for the process, and that's, that's all I have. All right, very good. Questions? Seeing none then, thank you, Paul. And uh, this means the uh, Cable Commission meeting, we're adjourned. So thank you very much. Thank you.